Hi, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Dunker Spot. We are part of 342 Productions. I am your host, Nikaias Duncan, and joining me as always is my co-host, Steve Jones Jr. Steve, how are you doing, sir? Aha! Feeling good, feeling great, happy to be here. Excited to be here. Thank you, Dunkers, for once again embracing your bounce. Uh, Dunker Nation, let's ride. YouTube, hi. Uh, Hit the like button, comment, subscribe. Uh, Nikaias, it's time to hoop it up. It is indeed time to hoop it up. It's been a fun weekend of basketball, a lot of NBA hoops, a lot of college hoops as well. Uh, Very quickly before we dig into the NBA portion, uh, any particular games on the college side uh, catch your eye? A lot of them. Any for you? Uh, For me, like getting to catch the end of the Stanford game last night was a lot of fun. I've been keeping tabs on what UConn's been able to do on both sides. Uh, the men's side in particular, the offense is a lot of fun to watch. I enjoy as I rail against college basketball. I feel like every year about how some of the offense looks. I, I am glad that UConn is a team that really cares about a whole lot of off ball movement, a lot of flares, a lot of it, it's it's fun stuff. So that that's probably it for me on the college front. Um, anything for you? No. Ah, fair enough. All righty then. On the NBA side, any teams catching your eye as of late? A lot's catching my eye, Nikaias. And yes, there, there's there's plenty of great hoops, especially in the women's tournament. Uh, put some clips on the timeline there. Uh, but we're getting down to the nitty-gritty, Nikaias. Last 10, 12 games, and you're starting to see the fire, especially in the league. You're starting to see the competition. You're seeing identities and flaws and things pop up. I, I think it's interesting. I watched Sacramento and Orlando. I watched Golden State, Minnesota. And those are matchups where you saw the back and forth. You saw teams looking to figure out how to find a way to win in different times. And it kind of restored the feeling a little bit for me. And you look up and you look at these standings and the Boston Celtics are 57 and 14. They are winners of nine straight. They go to Chicago. They win without Jalen Brown. They win without Drew Holiday. They win without Chris Tots Porzingis. You've got Kobe White in the locker room talking about how it doesn't matter who plays for Boston. They just find a way to win. And you got Joe Mazzulla sitting talking about how important each guy in the locker room is and breaking down why Jaden Springer had to come in with four seconds left in the third quarter because they had given up four <laughs> points in four seconds to Denver and Detroit and that every second matters. They're locked in. You know what else you see up there, Nikaias? What else do you see? The Denver Nuggets. 50 and 21, first team in the Western Conference to get the 50 wins. And as of this recording, the number one seed in the West. They've won 14 of the last 16 games. The two losses was when the Phoenix Suns lost their mind in overtime. And the other came with the left hand of Kyrie Irving. And we could talk about the brilliance of Nikola Jokic. We could talk about how good Jamal Murray has been this year, how tough it is to guard their actions with those two and Aaron Gordon, the defense of Contavious Caldwell-Pope, the work the second unit has put in to build up this team. Michael Porter Jr. shooting 42.9% from three post-All-Star break, 46.3 on catch and shoots, about 5.3 at tips, playing so well that Coach Michael Malone said that MPJ could go to Cabo whenever he wants and he'd pay for it. That brings me to Coach Michael Malone. I don't know if anyone's been paying attention, but this man is ready for the playoffs. I think the internet likes to call them rage timeouts. Uh, I was about to say, the timeouts have been coming earlier and earlier. I like to call them, do you want to win a championship timeouts? Dallas gets all these offensive rebounds. The the man called a timeout and almost went and got one himself. (laughs) Minnesota wasn't having it. Knicks came into town. He said, they have our attention. They go, they go get a win at Portland without Jokic, without Murray. And Coach Michael Malone says, I don't know how many teams you can say across the NBA are playing better than the Denver Nuggets right now. In a season when I'm pretty sure the majority of people have been saying the Denver Nuggets have been playing very well <laughs> all season long. He is going to find it. And those are the teams that you're chasing. And I think you start to look at it in a big picture sense. There's a lot of teams that are working to put together some really good basketball right now. And we are set up for a really, really competitive playoffs. And I hope that people are ready to enjoy that um, and and understand that, yes, some of these teams are going to fall short, but they've put themselves in a position to be good. And the team I wanted to talk about was the Minnesota Timberwolves. Six and three since Carl Anthony Towns goes down. Managed to go four and two on that long six-game road trip. Lost to Denver, beat Cleveland and Golden State. I think what stands out to me 
is they're putting themselves in a position to have that success. There's only a game out of the one seed. But they've doubled down on their identity. Their defense has remained just as strong as it has all year long. Great activity. They work to navigate screens with all their personnel. You know, it's not just Rudy Gobert who has done an incredible job defensively this year. It's Mike Conley pressuring the ball. It's McDaniels pressuring the ball. It's Anthony Edwards pressuring. It's now coming off the bench pressuring. It's Nas Reed doing his job. They're active. They're physical. They show help. They take away driving lanes. And they have this ability to have nuance within their scheme defensively to where we can put two on the ball. We don't have to. We can navigate these screens. McDaniels can slide right under a screen. Rudy gets out or Nas gets out. We defend. We can switch off ball. We maintain our principles. And they work. The biggest thing, if you want to watch great defense in a league that most people say no longer has defense, go watch the Minnesota Timberwolves and watch the possessions where there's a breakdown and there's an error. Because this is a league where a lot of teams can play offense. They can move the ball. They can make the skip passes. They can keep an advantage. Minnesota does a great job of scrambling and being able to recover. So when it's not a perfect world, they can still maintain that base. They can still show their help. And that ties me into their identity that they have. How far does it take them? I'm not sure yet. But every single night, they are going to bring it. And if you've read read or paid attention to Minnesota's quotes this season, this is a team that believes in what they do. Mm -hmm. They believe in who they are. And I think that has helped them get through these different stretches of the season where every time it looks like it's time to point at Minnesota, it doesn't happen. Offensively, is it a perfect world in the Kais? No. no. It's not. 6-29 left in the first quarter against Golden State. Guess how many points they had? Six. Hey, 5-13 left in the second. They have 31 points and are down 10. But they know who they are. And they work to get through it. And these are good reps for them in the playoffs. To go through these moments where the offense is lean, where things bog down and get stagnant, teams want to switch, To see teams lock in on Anthony Edwards in different ways. Two on the ball and pick and roll. When he's isolated, they're going to show help from the nail. They're going to show bodies and try and take away those driving lanes. For them to figure out how to create spacing and how to feel comfortable grinding throughout a late clock scenario. You know, they are able to have cuts from the wing, whether it's Mike Conley or nah. They keep movement. And now we're able to make plays. Anthony Edwards in one-on-one scenarios, doing a much better job of seeing where the help is coming from and knowing where the pass is going to go. Pick and roll. We've seen probably more skip passes from Anthony Edwards this year than we had last year because he's able to read the defense. It's not just a turbo button. He's making reads. He's seeing the right plays and they're running the right actions. One of my favorite things about Minnesota is just empty corner pick and roll. And when they decide to deploy it, and how they can just twist what you want to do. Hey, you're worried about Nas Reed because he's having a heck of a job. He's doing a great job this game. Here comes Anthony Edwards handing it back to Monte Morris. And now Anthony Edwards is on the wing. Pick and roll, empty corner. We got the lob if you help. We got the skip pass. We can use Anthony Edwards as a screener. We can space him on the weak side. We have Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert. And... In this scenario, you have Mike Conley, who just does an incredible job of engaging drop defense and making sure that he's able to see what the defense is going to do, commit, find Rudy Gobert on the roll, whose roles have been very important for this Minnesota team, by the way. And I will add Rudy Gobert, much more confident on the short roll. He's going to take these shots. He's going to make these good passes. He's going to make these plays. But I think about this team and what they have to do and do you think they're set up for success in the playoffs, in the guys? I am feeling better about it. Like, one, their defense is just going to travel. You've listed off all the candidates who've done a good job defensively for Minnesota this year. I think the defense is going to travel, and they should have solid transition play out of that. I'm starting to feel better about the offense. And, like, as you talked about Anthony Edwards and his growth as a playmaker, and this is something that you've been talking about throughout the season, so this isn't new. But as you bring up Anthony Edwards' playmaking and, you know, circling back to the Warriors game, like I, I ended up clipping it, I believe, as I was watching that game um, on set, watching that game as it was happening. And there was like a four or five minute stretch in the second quarter where Anthony Edwards just bent Golden State's defense to his will. Like, OK, cool. You're switching, trying to show some help. I can boogie one on one. 
if you're not going to put two on the ball, I can kind of dictate things in pick and roll. If you do put two on the ball, I can still dictate things. Like they end up running, it's kind of like a Denver-esque action where they ran it two times in a row where he lifts up from the baseline, gets a handoff, they put two on the ball. He's able to string out one and then on another one, he makes a skip to the left corner to, I want to say it was, I want to say it was Nas Reed, but it was someone in the left corner got a wide open three out of it. And just like that capped off the run. It's like, well, when Anthony Edwards is on like this, when he can get to the rim, when he can knock down shots in the mid range, when he can knock down pull up threes if you're too far back and drop, if you're now putting two on the ball and, and as you mentioned earlier, can get to these skip passes too, there isn't much you can do with Anthony Edwards as a concept. And like he just has so much potential to lift the ceiling of this Wolves group. Like, obviously, I think he is their best player. Like, that's not a hot take. But like one of the things that I've been keeping an eye on, so we've talked about what exactly does the decision making look like for him? When is he going to some of these shots? When is he making some of these passes? And as he gets better feel and as Minnesota as a whole does a better job of clearing space for him, simplifying some of his reads, just making it easier for him to operate, you're now starting to see some of the marriage of his pure talent, the growth that he showcased as a playmaker, and what that can mean for Minnesota's offense overall. Like, it's been very important for him to gain, get these reps, gain more comfort offensively, and then you zoom out. You mentioned Mike Conley, the timely shot making and the pick and roll play from him. Nikhil Alexander-Walker, knocking down the shots that he needs to on the perimeter. He continues to shoot over 40% from three. Um, during the stretch, what he's been able to do. Nas Reed, Nas Reed picking up the scoring slack. Like, as they get more guys to step up, like, I'm feeling better about what they're doing conceptually offensively. If they can get enough on that end, the defense should bring them to the dance. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better about them offensively. I still think the biggest key is how they're able to move the ball and generate shots when they are working to generate shots. That's the biggest bet. And I think the best thing that helps Anthony Edwards is the moments where they're not completely leaning in on him, and it's a mix. And you're going to have to live with some of those shots from Anthony Edwards. That's just part of the program. But the fact that he's more willing to not just make the plays, but he's able to see the plays is a big key. And I think when you go into the playoffs with a group of guys who know who they are, know what their identity is and believe in it, that can become dangerous. Now, it's going to be interesting. Because right now they're the three seed. Their first round matchup as of right now would be Phoenix and or Sacramento and or Dallas. So anything could happen. Mm -hmm. But this isn't, you know, that team with a game plan and ability to adjust is going to be interesting to deal with in a playoff setting. And I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to see what it looks like there. Likewise, um, I'll ask a quick question for you because we brought up some of the guards. Like, how have you felt about the backup guard play in general? I think between Monte Morris, steady play, taking more threes, Jordan McLaughlin as of late, he's been fun off the bench. Do you feel better about their guard play moving forward? Well, I think once they got Monte Morris and he was able to get comfortable in the system, you, you saw what the vision was. We want to have not just smart guard play the entire time. We want to have that blend of activity defensively. People who can play make but don't necessarily have to have the ball. They can space. If they get a kick, they can drive and keep an advantage. They can operate in pick and roll or handoffs. That's the kind of versatility they want from that guard room. And I think where it gets interesting is when you have Minnesota mixing the, the lineups and they're able to have some of these two and or three guard lineups, depending on how you feel about the personnel. And that's able to carry them through some of those moments where maybe we're not sure what we're looking for. Or you're playing with Kyle Anderson and teams are just playing off of him. Okay, how can we still generate and navigate the space we have the heady play to be able to get the type of shots we want as opposed to forcing the issue? So I think that's probably been the biggest boost for them is being able to know we can get to what we want to whenever we want to because our point guards have that kind of mindset. Got you. And this is why you are one of the best in the business because my next question was going to be how you felt about the Kyle Anderson usage. Uh, since Cat has been down, I think you, you know, peruse Wolves Twitter and just the general blogosphere there. What's happened to the shot and generally what teams are doing when he does not have the ball in his hands has been a storyline throughout this Minnesota Timberwolves season. But it does feel like he's a little bit more engaged now, being used a little bit more as a handoff hub to toss to him on the block sometimes or just within the flow of play. If their first action doesn't work, it's a kick to Kyle Anderson. And he just kind of finds something or find someone to go into two man game with. So, like, I felt better about the offense. And, like, defensively, very smart off the ball. There is just – it keeps up the theme of having a whole bunch of size in the front court when he's in, whether he's at the four or at the three, uh, if he's playing with the other two bigs. So, like, I've enjoyed the Kyle Anderson experience. I do wonder if they are able to continue to strike that balance with him offensively. Because, like, I just don't 
I don't think the shot is worth betting on in terms of the volume or the efficiency being high enough for where teams have to bend towards him. Um, but I've liked this play as of late. Um, have, has anything in particular stood out with you with Kyle? I mean, I, I wouldn't get into a debate about the shooting. The shooting probably isn't where Wolves fans want it to be, where Kyle Anderson wants it to be. But I don't think that takes away from his contributions to the team as a whole. I mean, if you look at this stretch going back even to the Portland game on the fourth, he's had five or more assists in all but two games. Mm. I think the, he had four against Indiana and he had four against Denver. But he's been able to contribute. And I think his ability to process offensively, understand how teams are treating him, and the times where Minnesota can flip it. Because, again, you have versatile personnel, so you can use Nas Reed as player X. And Kyle Anderson t- technically becomes your big with guard skills. Mm-hmm. So you can flip it to use him as a hub or a screener and let Nas Reed fly off for space. And... If he's able to continue the movement or keep an advantage or keep the ball moving for Minnesota, there's value to that. So I don't necessarily think, well, Kyle Anderson can't shoot. Teams are going to play off of him. I think that limits what he contributes offensively. I think that limits what he does defensively for that team to Mm -hmm. where he's someone you trust out there to be able to take on certain matchups, to be able to execute certain schemes. And there's going to be nights where he's going to close and people will be like, why? Well, defense. And then just circling back to the standings very quickly uh, is something that we've talked about earlier in the year. But with Phoenix, Sacramento, and Dallas all being there in that six to eight kind of bunched up together, uh, who do you feel is Minnesota's best matchup among those three? It's hard when you get to these conversations, especially in the Western Conference. All these teams are very good. So, I mean, your probably first glance is, oh, well, yeah, it's Sacramento. You still got to deal with DeMontis Sabonis who I will once again state has had no problem trying to elbow everyone in the face this year. Mm-hmm. And you still got to deal with De'Aaron Fox. I don't know if you want to sign up for that. The other version is Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. And then, oh yeah, Luka and Kyrie. So I'm thinking philosophically, if you're Minnesota, you may, you may sign up for Sacramento. But I don't... I would probably say Sacramento by default off for it, but... They've had some tough times with the Kings this year. Yeah. Sacramento's good. It's very dull analysis, but. Hmm. What are your what are your thoughts? I'm I'm engaging mine. Like, I think for I wonder if it's Dallas. It's kind of where my mind went. Because Luka and Kyrie naturally scare you, but like conceptually, you don't have to deal with the movement of Sacramento. And you don't have like the like Phoenix has all three of their guys plus the extra three point shooter from Grace Allen and others. Like in theory, like there's a level of offensive firepower that if you're sending two to the ball, like it can get kind of funny. I can't, I wonder if. Dallas just because you may match up better with some of those guys defensively. And with how Dallas runs their offense, there may be less movement for you to worry about. So it may be a little bit easier to kind of set your help principles from there. But even then, I wouldn't then I wouldn't love any of these matchups for Minnesota. Uh I get your point with Dallas. I think it's a fair one. In theory, you could probably be like, well, Luca's gonna do this. We make it tough on Kyrie with length and activity. We try and make these other guys beat us. But then, if you recall, Dallas did play Minnesota, and Kyrie had 35, and Luka had 34, and Dallas won that game. So, (laughs) it kind of becomes the... I feel like Minnesota-Dallas would remind me of Phoenix and Denver from the standpoint of, I understand what y'all are trying to do defensively. There is a chance this team could throw you over the top rope. Mm. Oh, wait, they didn't? Good job, type B. Because mm. yeah. you can see a world where, hey, okay, they're going to score, they're going to get their buckets, we're going to make other guys beat us, close out, rotate, all that good stuff. But then if they just take the shots and keep making them, and now you're in a situation where, okay, we want to switch. Oh, our switching hasn't been as good. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. What do you do with that scenario? I, I uh, Is it Phoenix? Now, keep in mind, they haven't played Phoenix since November. It could, it could be. 
Well, I, I don't know. Cause like I'm trying to play these matches in my head. Like I would imagine like Jaden would get KD. You can have now on book if he starts. Or if Anthony Edwards just says, I want the plus five that you've spoken about, that he just takes the Devin Booker matchup. You kind of play it out from there. And t- you know what? I just made the offensive firepower point with Phoenix. In terms of the shot profile, though, you may be able to play single coverage in the ways you can against Dallas. What do you mean? Well, hmm. if you play a drop, it's it's Phoenix Denver again. You play yeah. drop, and then Kevin Durant and Devin Booker make those shots. What you're in a different boat. Yeah. Now, if Phoenix decides to just not do the movement thing, I think I can understand where you're coming from. But if they're able to have mm-hmm. the shot making and the movement, I, I don't know. Yeah. Doesn't sound yeah, ideal. I guess. I guess single coverage in the sense of like if you switch out against Luke or a Kyrie, like those two can get to the rim and thus put you in a deeper bind in terms of free throws or extra rotation in a way that like the Phoenix group doesn't, or at least not consistently. It's like maybe you can get away with the switching a little bit more if you want to do that. But again, even then, you're still tapping right into the talent bag. Like it's still KD, Booker, and if healthy, Bradley Beal at the end of the day. And Bradley Beal's drives have been very important. I don't want to disrespect Sacramento because I'm in a fun place with them because I think they've done a lot, a lot of positive things for the playoffs. And mm-hmm. some of their, some of the way they're viewed, it feels more standing wise, prove it type beat than mm-hmm. anything else. And this is the West. So, I mean, you had teams rise back up to where now instead of you ascending, you have now fallen into the six, seven range. And that happens because it's the West. I would mm-hmm. probably guess it's Sacramento. Rudy, you play off. You play off Demontas. He's going to try and hit you. Contest. We have nineteen lengthy people to throw at uh, De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk. We'll be active and physical against your movement. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Uh, well, sorry, Sacramento. You're still a very good basketball team, uh, as are these other two. Uh, but that gets kind of tough. Uh, did you have any more thoughts on Minnesota, or did you have another team that you wanted to bring up? Uh, I mean, there's plenty of teams I wanted to bring up. I know you uh, definitely wanted to sing the song, so let's go ahead and sing the song. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't want to cut you off or anything like that. Uh, I did want to quickly circle back to the Orlando Magic. Uh, we talked about them a couple of weeks ago on the pod, and then again in a later episode once Jamal Mosley got the extension, but that was more just congratulatory versus like an actual breakdown. But a couple of weeks ago, um, you asked me how I felt about Orlando's offense, how I felt about the decision-making, I ended up asking you about their lineups, all that good stuff. You can go back, check out that episode if you want a deeper dive there. Since that episode, the Magic are 5-1 and one with their one loss come against Sacramento, a game that you referenced earlier. Uh, hasn't been the toughest of schedules. They played Brooklyn. They played Toronto twice. They played Charlotte. Big win against New Orleans. And again, the loss against Sacramento. But during that stretch, 11th in offense, which is a lot better than what they've been throughout the year. First in defense, because, of course, the defense has been elite. They're shooting 38.2% from three over that stretch. That would rank eighth overall in the league. More importantly for me, 38% of their shots have come from behind the arc during this stretch, which is a lot higher than the regular season mark, and it's a mark that will rank ninth in the league overall. And so, like, I've been intrigued with just the shot profile shift And I've been trying to figure out how much of that is just the opponent getting more stops, getting out and running and creating looks from there. How much of it is scheme stuff as we go back to that Sacramento game and the amount of zone that they saw in that game. And I did think Orlando did a pretty solid job of getting the ball into the middle and kind of spraying out from there, generating some corner threes. So like how much of their three point rate kind of uh, kind of blends into that and how much of it has just been general intention. We need to get more of these shots up. And so like that part's been intriguing to me, but kind of going bigger picture with them. Paolo and the playmaking has been a lot of fun, as have the drives. Franz has been an absolute bully getting downhill, and I'm still very confused as to why he just hasn't been able to hit anything from outside the arc. As Orlando has shot well from three overall, he's kind of been the lone guy that has been able to knock those down, and I am still keeping an eye on that portion because if that does circle back, like I think he is a good shooter, if that circles back, then some of the spacing him one pass away from Paolo, I think that could be more impactful. He already does good work as a cutter whenever teams send extra attention elsewhere. So I want to see what the off-ball value is going to look like there. Jalen Suggs continued to hunt out shots 
in an opportunistic way. And then this bench, man. We talked about him a couple of weeks ago. Jonathan Isaac has been on an absolute heater in addition to what he does defensively. Cole Anthony shot creation, pick and roll play, the drives, they've all been fun. Remains one of the best guard rebounders in the sport. He's gotten some timely ones during this stretch. Mo Wagner, the off-ball juice for him, not just the screening, but also the cutting, also the relocating. Some fun passing flashes as a driver as well, but like most more for me, it's the off-ball movement and kind of how that ties into what Orlando's been trying to build as a spacing group and how they've been able to, or at least they've been searching for ways to kind of puncture defenses in light of not having the best shooting talent overall. And so it's been a really fun stretch for them offensively. And then just conceptually, like what they've been able to do whenever they get to. Like I go to the New Orleans game, um, their base coverage, having JV up at the level, trying to force things at the sideline, how Orlando was able to kind of play out of that, move guys around, relocate, cut. They were able to find those gaps there. And then again, circling back to the zone game that they had against Sacramento. Didn't always end in made shots, but it did feel like the decision-making was cleaner. It did feel like they at least knew what they were trying to get to. And so to circle back to that conversation we had a couple of weeks ago, continuing to feel a little bit better about what they're trying to build offensively. They at least know where they're trying to get to. I'm glad you came to that point and that realization, because I think the key for Orlando, despite criticism, is they do have an identity. Mm. And you may have your concerns about the shooting. You may have concerns about the pace, about the tempo. They have felt much more comfortable as this season has gone on when things slow down than earlier in the season when it felt like they had no choice. It felt like defenses were dictating it to them and they were trying to figure out and find their way. I think that a big piece of that is Paolo Bancaro and the way that he has played. And I think he deserves a ton of credit. This might be the wrong episode to do it, considering how this could end. (laughs) But... It's it's not just the the playmaking that's just been a growth. Like that's it's always fun to say, hey, he's getting better as a playmaker. When you look at what Paolo's doing, you have to realize one, he has scored at such a high level in different ways, whether it's off the dribble pull ups, post up, the drives, getting to the free throw line. We have seen defensive shift how they are going to guard him. We have seen more teams not only show help early. But also, we're going to double you. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you want to, if there's a fancy stat for it, but I'm just going to tell you what my eyes have seen. Mm-hmm. I'll look up the, the fancy stat. When you're stat able you- to start the game just with a simple cross screen for Paolo, and he's now advanced to, I'm going to back down and survey and see where the help is coming because I know it is. Are you coming from the baseline? Are you coming from one pass away? And I can now fire these passes out. Is it a perfect world? No, it's not. But that's a big step, especially for where Orlando is and where they're going and how important he's been to it. I think that it's one of those things, and I'm glad you mentioned the bench. Because one thing I'll say about this Orlando second unit, they when you look at them, they got a lot of confidence. They got a lot of confident guys. If you're going to have a lineup out there with Markel Fultz, Cole Anthony, Joe Ingles, Jonathan Isaac and Mo Wagner, who out there doubts themselves? No. The and opponent think, trying, to, <laughs> trying to deal with them. I think these guys know who they are. And I think there's a lot of times where we credit teams for being able to flip their personnel to a degree. Like, I think we, we give that credit to OKC or an Indian or Utah earlier this season. I don't know if Orlando gets enough credit for using their guys in the ways that they do. To where in that second unit, Markel Fultz can bring the ball up, go to a post up, and everyone else stays spaced. It makes sense. Paolo and Franz can get a lot of the ball handling reps, which allows Jalen Suggs to just go be Jalen Suggs. Mm -hmm. And he's had the ability to have that jump shot improve because they're able to generate good looks for him. He's been able to drive and attack closeouts, neither finish or keep an advantage going because, hey, he's got the guard skills. He doesn't have that weight of having to open things up, though. And that's where I think the brilliance of what Orlando is, that's where it gets really fun. Now, they're going to have to keep working to generate good looks, and this is going to be a very interesting postseason for them. And I've asked the question, I think, every time we've talked about the Knicks, hey, are you ready for the Knicks to treat Orlando like they treated Cleveland? This is a discovery year for Orlando to a degree. And now for me, I'm watching to see how much can you get to the next option. 
how much confidence can you have in those moments? Because it's one thing to be a defense leads to offense type team. To do that in the playoffs, your defense has to be really, really key and your offense has to be ready. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it's going to get interesting because you're going to have a team that locks in on Paolo. While these are really good reps, it's going to, they're going to see more of that. And more guys are going to have to step up and they have to have get more creative with their usage as far as who screens for Paolo, what it matchups you attack, uh, who spaces where. And this is why this stretch of the schedule was important to me because they've been very good this year, very good at home. These are all home games. You lose Sacramento, who is desperate. Your next opponent is Golden State, who needs a win. Your mm-hmm. opponent after that, the Los Angeles Clippers, who need a win. And then, I mean, you play Memphis and Portland. Then you go at New Orleans. So, I mean, this, this is a little mini stretch right here. Mm-hmm. You, did beat the, you did beat the Pelicans. You made a statement in that game. That was very impressive. But that's I'm keeping my eyes on the magic during this stretch. Got you. And just uh just very quickly on the Paolo front. So I had to look up some stuff as you as you mentioned the fancy numbers. Uh of 35 players with at least 300 isolations, uh Paolo has been doubled the seventh highest amount. Uh, you know, in terms of percentage of those possessions he gets doubled on. And then with players with at least 100 post-ups, that's 37 of those. He is also seventh in double team rate there. So teams are absolutely sending more of those towards him. And as you talked about, like the different ways that you could use not only Franz, but also Paolo and how to get the guards involved. I love in general when Orlando plays a little bit more tempo, like we've talked about that already, but when they just kind of jet into stuff and then combine it with some of the spacing, like, I think that's where they're going to get their best stuff. Like there was a possession um, in the New Orleans game, about seven minutes left in the first Uh, Jalen Suggs, let the ball roll up a little bit after an inbound, picks it up. Immediately pass it to Paolo on the left elbow. It's basically pass and cut or how, whatever you want to dub it there. Pass and cut, Jalen Suggs gets downhill. Brandon Ingram meets him on the other side, so no drive there. He pitches it back to Paolo, and then they immediately flow into a Paolo Franz pick and roll. New Orleans switches. Brandon Ingram's kind of lurking around, trying to zone up. And Wendell Carter Jr. on the weak side of the floor sets a pin in. Paolo fires it to the right corner. It's a three for Jalen Suggs. He gets it to go. And I think... One, it just kind of speaks to, again, once Orlando sees two or sees help, they're doing a better job of playing out of that and countering that with cutting, with their general spacing. Also with these pin-ins, like Wendell Carter Jr. is just looking to hit people, which is cool. I also have a question about Wendell that ties back to a conversation we had earlier in the year. I think this was during the, uh, the Goga stretch. And you were like, hey, man, what's the, what, what is the Wendell fit? I'm not quite there, but like I am watching him – Like, after rolls, if he doesn't get the ball, like, where he's trying to space and what he's trying to do afterwards. And it's like, that feels like some of the rare clunkiness we see in terms of actual spacing and where you're supposed to be. Like, him trying to find those pockets if he doesn't get the ball. So that's been interesting to track. Um, But I have enjoyed him on the weak side. Like, he said a lot of pin-ins. He's making sure that he hits people. He's generally doing the right thing there. So keeping an eye on that front. And you know a thought that I had as I was, like, just watching a bunch of Magic stuff this morning? Are the Magic's just the Knicks from a couple of years ago? Or I guess the pre-Brunson Knicks? Oh, uh, well, no, because you like them a lot. More <laughs> so you like that Knicks team. No, but like I was thinking about the defense. I was thinking about the offense and the tempo. I was thinking about how much I enjoyed the second unit and how much faster that second unit plays and all that good stuff. And I was like, you know, is this just a rerun from a couple of years ago? It was a very, very sobering thought. As I was trying to parse through that. Yeah, yeah, it's in the chest, didn't it? It sure did. Yeah, you <laughs> like that. Like, oh, I did mm-hmm. this. Yeah. Go, go back to the one... archives if you're new. <laughs> the other guys felt about that Knicks team. But like, I he... get it, but... <laughs> um, I, I don't know if they're just that. Well, no, not, not in a literal sense. Uh, but I, think yeah, it's, I, just... I, I think there are elements of it. They do have a formula. Like, I guess for me, it's how many times have we seen their defense really get hit? to a degree where you don't believe in it or have their losses been, they didn't know what to do in the clutch or their offense didn't get sh- show up or a defense took them away. Like outside of like OKC and that one game where Miami lost their mind, I don't, there hasn't been too many times where I'm like, Hey, they're not, they, they don't have it on that. End. So I guess that would be, that would be interesting to see in the playoffs if they're put in that scenario, in that situation. Because it's tough. Like, if you're a defense first team, it is fun to get to the playoffs, but it is very hard once you're defense. They have found something. 
and now you're trying to adjust on the fly because mm-hmm. you're kind of baking in. We get stops, and that that can get tough. Yeah, like I think on that front, like to your point, no, it doesn't feel like teams really hit their base defense like that. They're just really good, and also there's that's a lot of a size to try to attack. I think the games in which they really get dinged, like I'm glad you brought the Miami game in particular, is when the offense isn't working and they allow teams to run on them. Because like we talked about the transition a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, there's low hanging fruit here offensively, which very quickly. Hey, do you know where the where the Magic rank during the six game stretch in transition frequency? Third, thirtieth. Oh, they are dead. <laughs> they are dead last overall. And I think they're bottom three in terms of just pushing in transition off of misses. I'm just like, how do we how do we get worse since I made that point? But at any rate, they are a team that allows teams to get get out and run against them. The thing with them is that they've just allowed a very low points per possession number in transition. But in terms of how often teams get out, they do get out against Orlando. And with Miami in particular, they're able to get stops and get out to the three point line and down shots and early offense it can be a little bit of a snowball effect there. So, like, I think that's where the matchup game is going to come into play for Orlando. Because right now they are, what, fifth in the East right now? They're fifth, yes. Six. They're fifth. They'll set them up with New York, which I don't think they get dinged to that degree if that's the matchup in terms of the three-point shooting. <sighs> I'm trying to say, is there a way that we get four or five Orlando Indy? Cause like I think that's where it could get interesting, but I don't I don't really see the Knicks sliding to that degree. Hey, do you, you, it's more likely that we get Cleveland, Orlando, four or five, because Cle- yeah. Cleveland is a half game up on New York and they're a game up on Orlando as we record this. So let me tell you this real quick, folks. Buckle up. The four or five matchup in the East is going to be real hoops. Real hoops. It's just a whole lot of defense and. The Indiana Pacers, who score a lot, and they are, they are trying harder on defense. I have a question for you. What's up, Makai? You're pretty. You're, you're pretty smart. You're good at this basketball stuff, right? Uh, I try at least. I try at least. One of the one of the uh, rising stars, one of the best in the world at this. That's what I'm told. The Indiana Pacers just gave up 150 points to the Los Angeles Lakers. What are we talking about? <sighs> What are you they saying to my face? They scored 145, though. They <laughs> gave up 150. <laughs> what are you saying to me? I'm just, I'm just bringing them up in terms of potential matchups. Uh, this is why I said I don't see the Knicks sliding to that degree, or even the Cavs at this rate. But like in terms of who could actually ding Orlando in transition was my overall point. And like if the seeding broke to where it's Orlando Indy, which to that degree, if we get Orlando Indy in the 3-6, Orlando's a game behind Cleveland right now for three. Like, if that's the three five, like Indy would be the team that could potentially get out and run a bunch against Orlando. Uh, I that, mean, was my, I mean, that was my only point. No, you got jokes aside. I do think Indiana's defense will look different with a playoff game plan. Mm-hmm. So I do think there is value for them to make the playoffs, as opposed to having to survive the play-in, mm-hmm. to a degree. Okay, uh, unless, unless the streets just want Celtics Heat, Bucks, Pacers in the first round. I mean, <laughs> I tell you what, I think Malik Beasley would be here for, for Bucks Pacers. If nobody else would. Uh, who, who else would be there for Bucks Pacers? Uh, who? Giannis, because he has had some, some pretty big games against the oh. Indiana Pacers. Also Tyrese Halliburton, who, who has also had some, some good games against the Milwaukee Bucks. Hey, real quick, I ask a question. Sure. Over the last 10 to 14 days, what have you done with the Philadelphia 76ers? <laughs> I've thrown my hands up. If you want my honest answer, I've thrown my hands up. Because like, it's been fun to track the Tyrese Maxey growth as he's come back. And like the downhill, the downhill juice for him has just been fun all year long. But again, keeping eyes on the foul drawing, some of the passes that he's making getting downhill, how he's dealing with more defensive attention. So, like, the maxi portion has been fun. Kelly Oubre taking all the shots is, it oscillates between fun and, okay, we get it, but also, but then I'm just sad about Tobias Harris. And so that kind of tanks it. 
But it's like, okay, cool. Paul Reed is doing stuff. And it's like, oh, wait, this is a lot of Paul Reed. And then it's Mo Bamba. It's like, hey, you're the three. Wait a minute. Teams are putting him underneath the basket. I've had very mixed feelings about the, the Philadelphia 76ers. You know what else has been odd? And like, I haven't brought it up on the pod. I don't want, odd's probably the wrong way. Probably the wrong word to use. But like, I think we collectively were very excited about all the things that Buddy Hill was doing when he first got to Philly. And those minutes have just continued to go down. And then now he's no longer starting. And it's been odd. And I wonder how much of that is just defense is keying in on the ways that Nick Nurse is using him. If this is just a slump, if this all gets better, if we do get Embiid back, which I haven't seen an update on Embiid in a minute, it feels like. Like, I wonder if that just kind of reinvigorates the Buddy Hield usage and you tie all three of those guys together and the offense just explodes again or what. But, like, the Buddy Hield portion has also been not as sad as the Tobias Harris tracking because he just hasn't really played well in this stretch. But it's been like, huh. Can I raise my hand and say something that no one's going to like? Sure. It's Kyle Lowry. Ah. Hey, look, man, if I'm going to have two of y'all out here, I know that guy. <laughs> hey, hey! I know, Which to I, Kyle's credit, you know you. He, he's gonna defend, and he is gonna get us what we need to get into. Uh, and so, this is where I think context is very important. Mm-hmm. I think if Joel Embiid was here, Buddy Heald would probably be more valuable to them than Kyle Lowry. Not to say Kyle Lowry wouldn't have value, but you probably see where okay, Buddy's spacing helps us more. We can slip more of these Buddy actions in, and I have to lean on it. I think Mm -hmm. the problem is, one, they have to defend. Two, they have to generate good looks. I don't think it's Buddy's fault necessarily. I just think there's a trust factor with Kyle Lowry, with Mm -hmm. Tyrese, with Kelly Oubre. There's there's a a feeling Kyle could probably defend multiple positions, so that might earn him more minutes. If Buddy has it going, he may play more minutes. If doesn't, then he's kind of in this box to a degree. Got Nick Batum you can throw out there. Campaign all of a sudden has a good game. I just think it's a... We are throwing everything at the wall right now and trying to figure this out. And I asked that question just because it's been curious. Like, I've been thinking about it. What do you do with the Sixer team that is has a way that they can compete, but they have to hit that to compete? And I don't know what to do with it because it's not Tyrese Maxey's fault. Like you watch a Sixers game and you watch Tyrese Maxey when he gets teams locking on him, which they have done in various different ways as far as putting two on the ball, trapping them, showing help. And you contrast that with when Philly gets a stop and Tyrese is out in transition. Or fly when, around. when Tyrese gets a blink of space in the half court, he's gone. That's been a fun thing to track. Tobias Harris, Kelly Oubre. It's very odd because the nights they have it, boy, that team looks different. And then the nights they don't, boy, people make jokes on, on social media. <laughs> So it's like Philly without any it's that's it's such a weird thing because they've now fallen into they've kind of were okay. annoying but also I was about to say they kind of fell like in terms of actual discourse it feels like they fell into the indie bucket like once Tyrese got hurt where it's like okay well y'all show some good stuff when y'all get healthy we'll care again and through this stretch, it's just been, again, like you find the, don't want to diminish him to like a nugget, but like you find the fun in the Tyrese Maxey growth and what he's seeing differently from from defense and stuff like that. But like overall, like I don't know if you can just wholeheartedly change what you think of Philly's ceiling because they, they this just isn't the team. No, 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 I agree. And so like that, that part has been, like that part has been really weird. So, like, I want them to get healthy. Because to your point, like, when Maxi pops, he just opens up the floor for literally everyone. Like, he's the guy, but also, again, the playmaking has gotten better for him. He's able to kick off that initial chain, and they can kind of, the ball can pop for him for there. Like, that's also the value you have of Kyle Lowry. He'll keep the ball moving. Like, one of the things that's been kind of funny for me to watch as I saw him in Miami and now seeing him in Philadelphia, he catches the ball on the wing until it's a little bit more often that he'll take that drive all the way to the paint, even if he's not looking for his own shot. You're getting two or three, maybe four hard dribbles getting all the way to the paint and then kicking it out to the corner to keep it going versus some of the uh, the Miami reps where it is a, is a catch and it is a pass or is a catch and a dribble and a pass. And 
best of luck from there. But yeah, Philly's just they're just in an odd place. I, I want them to get healthy. Uh, and then very quickly, there's a quick shout out to the Washington Wizards who who've won two in a row. A big win over Sacramento, a close win over Toronto. This is this mostly serves as a salute to uh, Jordan Poole and Denny Avdia and also Corey Kispert. Which Denny, the drives continue to be fun. He's also shooting with uh, reckless abandon when he catches it on the perimeter. So I, I don't know why I get quiet when I talk about Washington. Like, yeah, there's some there's some cool stuff happening in Washington. They're not good, but the Denny aggression's been fun. And like as we've talked about, <laughs> you know, we've talked about like Anthony Edwards and Tyrese Maxey, some of the playmaking growth. Like Jordan Poole has put some fun passes on film over the last couple of games. And like we talked about Jordan Poole during a mailbag question not too long ago about how his youth, not only did the roster context change from Golden State to Washington, but also his actual usage. He eventually comes off the bench, more ball screens, stuff like that. Just tracking the just tracking the passing growth. We're seeing more skills from him, a little bit more manipulation. So, like, that part's been cool. And then Corey Kispert just off the ball. Like, he is the movement guy in Washington sets there. So a whole lot of staggers. They do some fun stuff with him. If they go double drag, use him as the first screener and he's flying off, like, it's cool. And then the cutting has been really good for him. So just wanted to give a quick hat tip to the Washington Wizards, if you are still looking for fun there since. Hey. One, they're not good. Also, Balaj is out. So, like, if that was your primary source of <laughs> joy, then that, that stinks. But there, there's still some cool stuff happening. I just, just want to give them a quick tip of that. Nikaias, I'm going to peel the curtain back. We got, a, we got a comment saying, boy, I can't wait until the Wizards are, are good enough to Nikaias and Steve to be excited about our part of the rebuild. <laughs> and this is what you delivered the streets. Which I forgot all of is double funny if you consider oh. the amount of Hornets shoutouts you got, and triple funny if you consider if you're a long term dunker. If you're new, you'll get the joke. But if, if you're a long term dunker, I've been excited about the Wizards this entire podcast, except for this year. <laughs> <laughs> Which I mean, you picked the right year to. <laughs> but no, I, I just find the okay. This is cool. This is cool. Steve was like, "Hey, man, they started twelve and eight. Wait." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's me. But, but no, Steve has historically been the Wizards guy on the pod more than me. But they, they got some cool stuff going on. Uh, very quickly into some teams that make us think. So the Golden State Warriors, huh? Uh bars time again. It's not <laughs> bars. It's it coming. Even, yeah, uh, bar them up, Nikaias. It ain't even time for bars. It's just kind of funny. You know, I brought up the Houston Rockets, and they continue to win. And Jalen Green continues to just shoot the nets off the ball. So that's that's fun. But, like, a lot of the excitement about the Rockets is, wow, they're winning all these games. Hey, they kind of closing into the play-in. So then we turn our attention to the actual play-in. And this Warriors group, 5-7 uh, and seven in March, they are 17th in offense. They are 25th in defense in the month of March. And I just feel kind of bad for Steph. Because, like, it's a mix of him kind of being overtasked, though he shouldn't be considering who's on the roster. But based on how some of those guys are playing, and based on some of the other guys being guarded, like he's kind of the only advantage cre- plus advantage creator they have on the roster right now, at least consistently. Like Clay will get two off the ball, but that's going to require a whole lot of running. And if his shot isn't going, then it's just kind of tough. Jonathan Kaminga has continued to be aggressive, and like teams have shifted a little bit more attention to him. But like he's still trying to figure out when I do see help, am I just barreling through that help? Am I making the easy pass from there? And then if I do get off of it, where am I going from there? So like there's just been natural growing pains there, but overall that just leads to it's a it's a lack it's a lack of advantage creation for this Golden State group, and a lot of it falls on Steph. And then you combine this with Steve Kerr trying not to play Steph 40 minutes a night, and that's culminating in Steph playing what was it 30 minutes against Minnesota, and the Warriors getting blitzed in those minutes, and post game comments come out from there. My timeline is just in a frenzy. Like what are you talking about? And so I decided to go down a rabbit hole of Steph minutes just to see what was going on here. Because, like, I've watched the war. Like, I haven't cared too much about the minutes portion. Because, like, in theory, like, the second unit should be good enough to kind of hold serve while he's like, on the floor. What? Why should it be good enough to hold serve, Nikias? 
What move what? did they make to make the second unit good enough to hold serve, Nikias? I knew Who you would be the person to make it hold serve, Nikias? <sighs> well, you s- <laughs> get out the camera, though. Um, they brought in <laughs> they uh, they brought in Chris Paul uh, to help alleviate some of the bench concerns. And while it is cool that Chris Paul is back to knocking down threes, and while it is cool that Chris Paul is largely not turning the ball over, which has been the case for most of his career. That man does not get to the rim. He does not get to the free throw line. More of his pick and rolls have become switches. And on the other end, he knows where to be on defense. Sometimes the body just don't get there. And when teams try to attack him, that leads to more help. Golden State has to send. And boy, have their rotations been a mess defensively, just team-wide. Which doubly hurts because, like, you move to Draymond at the five in part to kind of simplify things. You just have your quarterback. You want to maximize the offense, obviously. But, like, okay, cool. Draymond's quarterbacking things. We should be okay. And it, (laughs) it hasn't hit the way that I thought it would, especially during this recent stretch. And now you throw in the back issues with Draymond, too. And it's how much can you reasonably rely on him to carry the defense when he's out there? Like, honestly, I would like for them to to experiment more with Draymond and Trace out there together. Like, at least looking at the numbers, like, those lineup, that pairing has been solid. And then even conceptually, if you think about the defensive end, like, you could have Trace closer up to the level and you have Draymond to clean things up on the back end. And, like, you can at least get some activity there have more of a live play on the back end and you're able to get out and run or at least flow into early offense. And maybe it's a little bit easier for like your non stuff guys to create advantages. And you're able to flow from there, but like they just haven't really been able to get the stops that they need. And the offense has been, we will call it underwhelming. Well, so I'm, just, I, I'm just in a rough spot with the warriors right now. Well, outside of getting you to do that bit, here's my thing, right? <laughs> How good is their defense? How good is the best version of their defense? How good is their offense? How good is the best version of their offense? What's their best lineup? What's their second best lineup? Do we have any uh, answers to these questions? I mean, I guess in terms of like their best lineup this year anyway, it's been Steph Pods, Andrew Wiggins, Jonathan Kaminga, and Draymond Green. It's what's, their next, what's their next best one? Uh, next best one would be uh, Steph Clay, Wiggins, Kaminga, and Green. Okay. Here's my thing. When you're trying to find it offensively and defensively, and you're trying to find the lineup combinations, and you're also trying to get guys going because you need guys to play well, and you're also not defending at the level that you're used to, and also offensively there are question marks, it becomes this to a degree. And I thought they had a – they fought in that Minnesota game. You know, Minnesota flipped on a dime real quick, but what a fourth quarter. They had a lead. Start fourth quarter they had defensively. But Golden State was in control, came back. That kind of thing happens. So it's very good. Hard place to win. But there were these moments where I looked up, and it's a Chris Paul, Gary Payton, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, Trace Jackson Davis lineup, which I understood on one end of the floor. (laughs) But on the other, how many help points are you giving? A lot. Like it's, you go. I was about to say, oh, it's, everyone ex- it's everyone except Clay. Because, like, you know, something that we've talked about, like, as well as Chris Paul can shoot, there is an element of, okay, we don't know if he's actually going to take this open shot. So we could probably cheat off of him more than what his actual shooting talent would dictate. Because we don't know if he's going to take it, in addition to him having, like, the slow load up with the jump so you can contest and stuff. But yeah, and like GP2, you're okay with helping off of him. Like Trace isn't a three point shooter. And Draymond, he's certainly been taking them this year. Boy, has that fallen off a cliff in March in terms of the shooting. So, like, yeah, you just, yeah. In theory, those are three guys that probably work best as rollers that are now all in the same lineup together. Which, in theory, you could make it work if you find the right matchup. But Minnesota didn't cooperate. Hmm. You go small. You got Chris Paul. You got Pods. You got Clay. You got Andrew Wiggins. You got Trace Jackson Davis. How many people are we helping off of in that lineup? Well, I mean, not as aggressively as the the first lineup that you named. 
But like in terms of we are terrified of this guy, like it's still just clay. And this this is where it becomes okay. Now what do we run? This player is supposed to help us with our pick and roll attack. Teams are not cooperating with their pick and roll defense. We go back to our movement. Teams are not cooperating when this person catches the ball. Okay, we're stuck. And I feel like that's been the story. Like a whole bunch of noise. Have fun. Do all the takes. It's cool. They've gotten Kaminga to play very, very well. They've gotten Pods to play very, very well. We've seen Draymond show flashes. Heck, in that Minnesota game, he had some great, hey, I'm not at the level. Actually, I am. Trap. Ha ha. Mm-hmm. Steph's been incredible this season. We've had stretches from Wiggins. You got Clay shooting 40% from three post All Star break. My other thing is how many of these people have played well at the same time? I feel like that's been the problem. Well, that's been a problem, I guess. But yeah. And, and so for me, this is a team that. They need to be... Do you remember how I felt about the Los Angeles Lakers team post-championship? Where it was like, I think they could do it, but I don't think they've won enough games to be in the spot they need to to do it. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about Golden State. It's very easy to copy-paste Golden State, LA. You don't want to see them in the playoff series, all that good stuff. It's true, though. You don't want to see these teams in the playoff series. And they know that. Mm -hmm. The problem is they are going to face each other with one of them advancing to play another game. And the other is uh, going to Cabo. That's that's the issue. And so that's what they have to face. They have to figure out how to get as good as they can for that matchup. Or you got Houston coming. I do want to make a quick Houston point because I'm sure you got something else on Golden State. Okay. Hey, man. Salute on the A-game win streak. Jalen Green cooking. No, it's not just because of Shingun. They wanted to play faster before he went down. Just go look at the shot clock data. They're more willing to take early shots, and they're making more of them. But uh, this guy's going to tighten up pretty quick, the guys. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you play the Blazers on Monday. Then it's at OKC, at Utah, against Dallas, at Minnesota, against Golden State, who, boy, they're going to want to beat you. And then against Miami. And then at Dallas. So, hey. Hey. It gets hazy. Ooh, while we're on da- while we're on Houston, I did have something that I wrote down in my notes. Like a drop about their small ball lineup. So anyway, since shin has been out, Houston's gone 6-0. Oh. Their most used lineup is their small ball starting unit. Fred Van Vliet, Jalen Green, Dylan Brooks, Amin Thompson, Jabari Smith Jr. All right? A plus 17.3 net rating per NBA.com. Very good. Of 35 lineups to log at least 30 minutes in that time span, that is seventh. So of these 35 lineups, the Rockets start new starting unit. They are first in offensive rating with a 139.7, which is absurd. They are 32nd of those 35 lineups in defensive rating, which is very funny in light of like some of the Shingun conversation. I've just been kind of like, when is anyone going to bring up like the other side of the, of the thing here? Bring it up, man. I'm just, it's just again. I talked about it last week. Like they're they still small at the end of the day. Like you can still get them at the rim. And so like it's just funny in light of that starting to not even really starting to bubble up in earnest. Like I don't want to overplay it. But like yeah, they are playing faster without Shingun. But it's just kind of funny that I just I just personally haven't seen the the defense with that group in particular. Because like overall the defense has been very good. Like the second unit in particular did a good job with Houston um, defensively. Which again. Not that it's all on him because it isn't, but it has been fun watching Jock Landale play like an NBA player uh, over the last couple of weeks. So that's cool. Um, but yeah, I'm just like we all the fun with this with this smaller group, and I've had a lot of it. I mean, screening Jabari aggressive with the jumper, Jalen Green doing all the things, Fred Van Bleed drives and kicks, and he's also shooting shooting the ball, getting them organized, all the good stuff. That group ain't really defending that well, and I do kind of wonder like, hey, if they don't hit shots to a ridiculous degree, like what is that lineup going to look like? And I think we're at least going to get an answer one way or another as to your point. The schedule tightens up a little bit. So it's just something I'm keeping an eye on. I don't want to, again, I've had a lot of fun with Houston. And if things continue, like they are just going to be the 10 seed. Oh, but okay. Just, so it's, 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 been, it's been a week. And last week I said, hey, big dog, we do about the plan. I ain't there yet. 
one week thing. later. One week later, <laughs> so if they continue to do this, then they go be <laughs> No, make a stand. You, stand, you, stand up. <laughs> stand up. Stand up is crazy. <laughs> I feel much better about Houston than I do about Golden State. I, I put it that way. So say it. Say it. Fine. I feel better about Houston than I oh, do about Golden State. Oh, hey, all right, man. What you, what you want to talk about, man? Nah. That's crazy. <laughs> nah. But no, just, just a little bit worried about Golden State. Like, it's a group. They just haven't really been able to find consistency on either side of the ball. And, like, that worries me. The lineup combination has been in and out. You look at the wing room again. It's like we've gotten the growth of Kaminga, but then we've had this Andrew Wiggins season, which before any other basketball thing, like I just hope that dude is okay. Yeah. It's just been like a really weird just year for Andrew Wiggins. I don't have any information, and even if I did, like I wouldn't disclose that on a podcast because why would I do that? Mm-hmm. But like it just feels like there's just been a lot going on, and so like I do hope like overall like people aren't discounting. There may just be out external factors as to why Andrew Wiggins has said an inconsistent season. And I hope there is gr- legitimate grace given there. But with that, like the on court product has been very inconsistent. And I wonder just how many of the problems for Golden State, particularly on the defensive end, how mu- what percentage of it is solved if it's if Andrew Wiggins is just sturdier at the point of attack or just sturdier in space? If there are less on ball breakdowns from him do we minimize some of the help lapses that we've seen from Golden State this year? Because they aren't in rotation, because Andrew Wiggins has been able to contain. The defensive slide is not 100% his fault. That's not the point that I'm making. But, like, it has been a noticeable drop-off from even last season's version and certainly the All-Star version. And, like, that that part, it it stinks. If you don't have that, if you're not able to force turnovers, if you're not able to get out, you know, force misses and get out and run and transition. And it's a bunch of half-court offense in which, look, this up earlier, like, teams are switching, I think, the ninth highest rate against Golden State pick and rolls this year. And that number skyrockets when steps off the floor. Like, if you aren't even get juice there, and depending on if Clay is in or not, like, some of the off-ball stuff doesn't have the same juice. What exactly are you getting into consistently, especially against good teams? And so, like, I would like for them to be able to find it. But again, I said I did a whole thing looking up Steph minutes. I don't even want to get into it because, like, ultimately, like, he's just been around 31 to 33 minutes a game all season long. But something's got to give. Like, we're this late in the year. Like, I go all out, go all out with the small ball lineups. Just like, We're just going to score. Be Pacers West. Or really dig into these defensive lineups and say, fine, we are going to get stops and we are going to hope that Steph – Steph Clay can do enough late in games, and we just win some of these 103 99. It's like them trying to find them on both ends at this point just has not worked. And I am losing confidence in their ability to find enough two way lineups to make it work. Like the roster construction itself kind of blends itself to they have limited options on that front. But it's just been, it's, it's just been a weird year. And we're 70 games in. Bars. Gosh darn it. What I tell you, folks. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to I just wanted to play better. And then very quickly, since we're deep in the pod, um, just keep your eyes on the New Orleans Pelicans. Again, a 2 0 since Brandon Ingram got hurt. Uh he suffered a bone contusion. He's gonna be reevaluated in two weeks. Um, so in those two games, a big win over Miami on the second night of a back to back, and they beat Detroit. CJ McCollum with 53 points across those two games shooting over 52% from three in those two games. Uh, Steve, would you happen to have any C.J. McCollum stats? Uh, 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 ahem, ahem. I already have it queued up. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I have it. Uh, the New Orleans Pelicans are 22-2 and two when C.J. McCollum scores 20 or more points. They're 21-4. and four. When he has five or more assists, they're fourteen and zero. When he has twenty or more points and five or more assists, there you go. There we go. It is fitting that uh, in these two games, CJ McCollum has uh, fifty three points and fourteen assists, which would mean he is uh, clearing those benchmarks. Uh, uh, can I can I add to your point quickly? Sure. Uh, defense. Uh, the bench is making shots. Uh, shout out to Najee Marshall and Jose Alvarado. That helps things. And also, Larry, it makes it a lot better when Larry Nance is, is, is back to being Larry Nance Jr. 
And it's like, oh, yeah, that, that drop works. And there's some switchability. And, yeah, yeah, you're moving the ball, making some plays. Ah, just want to tip my cap to the bench real quick. And Herb Jones initiator. There you go. Good stuff. Uh, as I had in my notes, uh, literally in order, CJ McCollum in his stats, Najee Marshall in his stats, Jose Alvarado in his stats, and uh, Larry Nash Jr. and his stats. So I guess I would just say Zion's good at basketball. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork, dream work, et cetera. <laughs> hey, how do we feel? And I meant to bring this up uh, when we did like the whole question thing last week. It was coming after the, uh, the win over the Clippers. How do we feel about Zion just being the big wing defender? I like the idea. I, like, that's I, a I, fun development. I, I like the idea. I like what he's done defensively. It's been it's, it's been it's been fun stuff. Yeah, like if he's just going to be that, like going over the possessions that he had to defend Kawhi in that game they won like a week and a half ago. At this point, it's just like, oh, right. Zion's just strong, and if you don't have a bunch of wiggle, he could just stay in front of you and be strong. And you're not going to get, like, the strength-based stuff against him. That could get interesting. Like, that was one of the things I was excited to see when the the Heat-Pelicans matchup happened, or rematch happened. Like, one, there's just, you know, Jimmy said we are the better team after the whole skirmish the last time they played, all that good stuff. So, like, there was inherent, like, bad blood is too strong because, don't you know, it's a regular season game at the end of the day. So, like, there was, there was a little extra to this one. But I was just like, you know what? Zion has done better defensively overall. And against strength-based drivers in particular, like, those are the type of dudes he should be okay defending. I want to see him matched up against Jimmy a couple of times. But granted, that, that just turned into uh, five Pelicans in the paint. Miami hit shots, we dare you. Miami could not do that. And that game got out of hand very quickly. But. We can, we can circle back to that. There's, there's a shot-making discussion to be had with New Orleans defense. And Oklahoma City's to a degree, but we we ain't got time mm. for that. A tease. <laughs> ah, he liked that. He liked that. And I guess just to empty the notes, I think we will we'll save the other big discussion for the next pod. Uh just wanted to quickly shout out Keon Ellis, who has uh started six of the eleven games he's played in March. He's shooting forty four percent from three in this stretch. The defense has been very good. And uh, he's doing good things for the Kings. Brother. It's nice to see him pop. What's we up? are supposed to talk all NBA, and you <laughs> snuck in the Keon Ellis. <laughs> I'll ask you a first team question, because I would imagine like four of your five going to be Jokic, Shea, uh, Luca, and Giannis. Wait a I minute! Deliver- What's up? We not doing? We not doing all NBA? <laughs> we can do. All- we can do all NBA. Let's let's do let's do all NBA. We're here. <laughs> Let's have some fun. So let's start with that question. Again, like I would imagine uh, Jokic, Shea, Luka, and Giannis are going to be four of your five for the first team. How much did, how much internal debate did you have about that fifth spot? I had no internal debate about the fifth spot. Okay, so you're just, you, you know who you're The first team is the easiest team to do. Like, here's the, here's the thing with All-NBA. It's positionless. Why would your yeah. first team not just be your MVP ballot? Yeah, I mean, I, that question would also carry over to the MVP ballot. No, I got my five locked in. Okay. My, my five have not moved. Like, here's the thing. Like, for me, I start out wide, cast a wide net, do the MVP discussion while y'all make fun of me, and then I watch as y'all do gross stuff, and I've already got my five locked in. <laughs> and I try and sprinkle it out with Nakai. I say, hey, do you think there's anyone else that could be in the conversation? What about this person? What about that person? It's no, no, no. And it's like, all right, cool. Here's my five. So what, where did you stress with the top five? <laughs> well, I had those four, and then I was kind of going back and forth between Jason Tatum and Kevin Durant for that fifth spot. And oh. I ultimately, yeah. Oh no, no, no! I, I you, tell me more. Uh, I'm intrigued by this. Okay. Well, it kind of circled back to well, it went back to a conversation we had about like how we view MVP versus All NBA, and how we view Defense Player of the Year versus All Defense, and like factoring in the winning portion, and like how heavily that weighs um, across the different awards. And so, like, for most of the season, I have felt like Kevin Durant has had a better year than Jason Tatum. But, like, because of where Phoenix has been standing-wise, like, I likely wasn't going to have KD ahead of Tatum for MVP stuff. But all NBA was where it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, But I think with what we've seen from Tatum post-All-Star break, particularly with the shooting turning around the way that it has, 
and he's also had just had some really good defensive games in this stretch as well. Like I, I probably lean Tatum for that fifth and final spot on the first team right now. And like Katie would just be my very first uh, second team guy. But that's where I was having some of the debate there. Like I, I think Jokic, Shea, Luka, Giannis was locked in. Like Tatum versus KD has kind of been back and forth for me all year. It's interesting. It's interesting because I, I understand the difference between all NBA and MVP. I think it all kind of ties together, right? So I've been thinking about this. And number one, salute to the names that are just already eliminated that you can't even think about. Joel Embiid, Donovan Mitchell, Jamal Murray, Jimmy Butler, Chris South Porzingis, Julius Randle, Trey Young, Larry Markin. Not that they might have made it. You don't even have the choice. They're out of here. Mm-hmm. You can't even talk about it. I am intrigued to see if all NBA being positionless is the reverse of all defense being positionless and that more guards and wings get recognized than bigs do. Mm-hmm. And you're no longer forced into deciding uh, uh, to honor a big because it can get tricky if you do the mats, 15 spots. I do find it a little odd that the first positionless year is after all the years where it was a decision between Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic. Mm-hmm. And Embiid's not, it even, yeah, doesn't matter. It's, a, it's unfortunate. Uh, but again, for me, I can understand the difference between honoring a guy on the first team and not having them in the MVP conversation. But for me, it's your five best players. Mm-hmm. If you get the five for the MVP, to me, that should be your first team. That's that's who you believe were the five best players all year. That should just be an easy copy and paste. Now, problem is there's 10 slots left with a whole bunch of names. And for me, I didn't go full Nikias, but I built myself a big list. (laughs) Hey, who from each team has an argument for all NBA? And then you whittle it down. And then you have to double check to make sure they're eligible. But boy, that 10 got sticky. So uh, we agree the first team, Nicole Jokic, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Giannis, Jason Tatum, Luca. Uh, those are the five, yes. All right. This is typically where things go left between me and Nikias on these all NBAs. Yes. Which means <laughs> we're gonna end up having the same team this year. It's gonna be funny, very funny. So, so here, here's I had a really tough time once you got the list together. I kind of tiered it. Like, people, I was like, hey, I think they're probably going to be in. Then, like, mm, I think they probably should be in. And then it was like, they're playing well, but I need to, like, they're they're not they're not in, they're not in that conversation. Yeah. And then I had a tough time differenti- differentiating between the second team and the third team. So I'm like, well, what honestly, what makes the difference between this person and that person? Mm-hmm. So it's going to get real, real personal, real subjective. What's your second team, because? All right, let's have some fun. Uh, second team as of March 25th, as we record, um, Kevin Durant, Jalen Brunson, DeMontis Sabonis, Anthony Edwards, and Kawhi Leonard. Ah, That's my second team right now. <laughs> we only have one difference. Oh, okay. I have Jalen Brunson, Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, DeMontis Sabonis, LeBron James. Ooh, LeBron over 80. Okay. Or Ant, rather. 20, 25, 8, and 7, shooting 53% from the field. Ain't too many people with that stat line. That's that's pretty true. That's pretty true. <laughs> it, naturally, the the literal first name on my third team is LeBron James. So, like, it's it's not. <laughs> hey, and, and the guys, you should mind the game. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Uh, I actually have JJ on the third team as well. Um, <laughs> but what, what's up? I, I thought. Okay. Anyway. What's your third uh, team? <laughs> Uh, third team for me is where it got uh, very tough. Oh boy! And this is this is where I. Uh... So here are all of the names. Well, I guess Sans LeBron, since I just admitted he's on my third team. But these are all of the names that I considered in in third team conversations. And this excludes Devin Booker and Tyrese Halliburton right now, where I'm not sure if they're going to end up qualifying by the end of the year. I will circle back in April, like as I know who's played how many, then those two will get back into heavy discussion for me because I think they both played well this year. Tyrese, obviously, since the injury has been down, but like I don't want to discount the literal first half of the year for him. Um, so like no book or no Halliburton here, just because I don't know they're gonna qualify yet. Send the list outside of t- <laughs> send the list is crazy. But guys, I consider Tyrese Maxey, Bam Adebayo, Zion Williamson, De'Aaron Fox, Rudy Gobert, Paul George, Victor Wembanyama. Anthony Davis, Jalen Brown, Steph Curry, and Paul George. 
And so I had to pick four out of that list of players. Did you say Paolo's name? Uh, Paolo would also. <laughs> he didn't Paolo, say Paolo's name. I didn't name. say, I didn't say Paolo. Magic, <laughs> Orlando Magic. God bless Paolo. Like, we, remember we had the All-Star conversation earlier this year. Like, I was like, hey, man. Like, he, he's, he is leading this Orlando Magic group. How much better has he been than Scotty Barnes individually? Like, we, we had this discussion earlier this year. Like, I do think, like, Paolo has been very good, obviously. But, like, he does fall below the efficiency threshold for me. So who did you like pick? <laughs> anyway, so we got LeBron. We got Anthony Davis. And that concluded, like, the firm portion of the program. My final three right now, I have Steph, Jalen Brown, and Paul George. But I feel like that I'm going to have some altering to do by the time uh, the last day of the season comes around. Hmm. Like Zion very, Zion very much creeping up the list for me of what he's done defensively. And again, remains a powerhouse inside the yard. De'Aaron Fox was a tough leave off. Just because it's just been such an inconsistent offensive year for him until it hits like the last five minutes of the fourth quarter in which he just goes superhuman. But like the rest of the game and thus the rest of the season also <laughs> also matters. But like he's close for me. Well, what's up? Well, I, I just I hear you going through this. I think you're 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 hitting the wrong portion. Okay. My my third team was Stephen Curry, Anthony Davis, Jalen um, Brown, Anthony Edwards, and Tyrese Halliburton. You said Paul George, huh? You seem uh you seem surprised. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Like, I will say, like, I guess first and foremost, as you went through the list of players that are just eliminated, like, I probably just don't even have them if Donovan Mitchell is available for this award. And that's not to say Joel Embiid's just on the first team if he's healthy. But with, like, Donovan Mitchell out in particular, like, I think that that gets pretty easy. Like, he's probably a second-team guy. Everyone else bumps down one, and we're just kind of good to go. Um... But, like, I do think the the shooting, the driving, the playmaking, the defense for Paul George has been very important for this Clippers group. Has it, has it been more important than Paolo's? And I even have Paolo on my list. I do feel like he's been better than Paolo this year. Which, I mean, obviously, that gets funny, like, comparing roles and stuff. But Okay. Because I, I had a tough time. Paolo... I had in until I went through everything. Mm-hmm. If Tyrese doesn't qualify, probably Paolo would slide in. Zion was up there. Devin Booker. Devin Booker against Jalen Brown had me in a headlock. That's, I don't know why I chose that battle. <laughs> um, that's what that's really like Devin Booker is really he's been he's been insane. But he's at uh pull up basketball ref very quickly. He's at 57 games right now. Like if Booker clears, like I do feel like on balance, like Booker's had a better year than Paul George. Actually, question for you as you kind of go through some of the lists. Like, how close was Wimby for you? Was he, like, a, a very early cutoff from the list? I imagine he made the longer list, but. No. Oh, Wimby, Wimby didn't make none of my lists. No disrespect. Hmm. I mean, not for all NBA. He's been great, but not. Mm. Okay. Is that hey, just going to. Here's here, I'll give you my subgroup. Okay. Uh, Damar. Rudy, Pascal, Brandon Ingram, Paul George, Jalen Williams, James Harden, Jared Allen. They slid quickly. And yeah. then I had above them uh, De'Aaron Fox, Tyrese Maxey, uh, Bam, Damian Lillard, and then the, the injured bigs. I got you. Bam is good. <laughs> Bam is someone that's like very high up on the like the in consideration portion of the program. I just list out the names, but Bam's up there. I I want to see how Bam finishes the year offensively. I think I think Bam would have made it if it wasn't. I think the defense just warrants him. The defense probably alone warrants him being in the discussion. Like I listed Rudy Gobert as one of the guys I thought about. Most of them didn't make third team for me. But I think if the defense alone for Bam has been good, and like the scoring Paul efficiency George. is kind of waxed and. Kind of helped and float this year. Like a strong finish there. Miami claims a top six seed. Like it's 
again, like I, I would probably characterize my list as I have 12 in pin and then or 13 in pin. And then the last two is where it gets kind of we'll see what happens. And the guys, Paul George or T Mac? Thank you for uh, listening to this episode of the. <laughs> it's, it's going to be uh, Tracy McGrady for me. However, I respect uh, what Paul George has done for the new generation. So, uh, honestly, one probably one of the more underrated future Hall of Famers that we have, which is hilarious to say out loud. But I think a lot of people get lost in the all the the jokes with Paul George. It's like this. This was one of the best wing defenders in the league at his peak, and it's still very good. Could score at all three levels. Like in terms of three pointers made, like he has already showcased. Like he, he's already one of the best three point shooters of all time. In terms of makes, and then you factor in the volume and the efficiency on top of that. Like he's been one of the best wing shooters ever. Paul George deserves a, a little bit more credit than he deserves. I think. Uh, I ain't taking him over T Mac though. But all due respect to that man. Okay, uh, did you have any uh, any further thoughts on all NBA or any closing thoughts in general? Any shout outs you want to give or anything that comes to mind? Uh, no, it, it's going to be tough. I, I I think it's going to be interesting to see how do you value. You know, it's it's going to be hard to imagine Steph not making it, LeBron not making it, which makes the list even smaller for potential candidates. Mm-hmm. And so I think the positionless thing actually turns it into some of these hypotheticals we see every single day on social media where mm-hmm. now you are literally having to compare Paolo against Tyrese Halliburton or Devin Booker against Jalen Brown, and that gets interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it was a fun exercise to do. Now, it won't be easy. It will not. Uh, cannot wish my third team to look uh, very different by the time <laughs> the regular season rolls around. But, uh, but no, that's where I'm at right now. Uh, without further comment, Thank you for listening to or watching this episode of The Dunker Spot. If you haven't already, please subscribe to us. We are on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Podbean, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. And if you are watching us on YouTube, we are here on JJ Reddit's YouTube channel every Tuesday. That is the day after Monday, the day before Wednesday. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, come check us out. Subscribe. We're here every Tuesday. And there's a lot of great content coming through the channel every day, all throughout the week. So come rock with the entire 342 crew. You can follow me on Twitter at NakaiasNBA. You can follow Steve on Twitter at SteveJones20. Join the Dunker Spot community on Twitter. We're having fun discussions in there. And if you have a League Pass subscription and you want to watch basketball or just in general hang out with Steve and I, you can do so via Watch Playback. If you have a League Pass account, it is free to create your account or create your profile on the platform. You're getting real-time analysis from us, breaking things down during commercial breaks. If we have fourth quarter or overtime antics, we're breaking down what went wrong what went right and in general it's a place to you know if you want to rant about the job or life in general laugh at some stuff drop some food takes if you want we bring people up on stage we talk about all kind of things so if you just want a safe haven to watch hoops and have some fun come rock with us the link is should be hyperlinked in your description so just click on that once again it is free to create a profile if you have a lead pass description you are good to go and with that we will catch y'all on thursday Hey, man, why Creighton did that to my Lady Rebels, dog? <laughs> <laughs>